I'm going to start by telling you a story about uh, this man. Um, so this is Alejandro Rico Guevara, and he is an evolutionary biologist who was born in Colombia. Um, when he, during his youth, he was walking through uh, the rainforest, and a hummingbird flew up to him and just hovered in front of his face. And Alejandro told me it was just there for a split second, but it was clear that it had a completely different personality than other birds in the forest. And he became really interested and obsessed with hummingbirds. And he found a way to channel that obsession by joining the lab of one Margaret uh, Rubega. Um, both of them realized that they had independently um, learned this, that this f textbook fact about hummingbirds couldn't possibly be right. It was the idea that they drink nectar through capillary action, that fluid automatically shoots up their tongues in the way that it might do when you put a straw in a glass full of water. But capillary action is fast, and hummingbird, uh, capillary, capillary action is slow, and hummingbirds are really fast. A hummingbird's tongue will flick in and out of a flower 18 times a second. How could capillary action possibly work? So the two of them set out um, to try and solve this mystery by creating this um, really intricate filming setup. Alejandro created the studio where he had these glass flowers that were see-through so that he could film the hummingbird's tongue as it shot in and out of this artificial bloom. And it took a lot of effort. It didn't work at, at, start, at the start. He had to futz around with the lighting. But then finally he did it. He did it. He recorded the footage that he wanted. And he gave me this great quote when I interviewed him that I knew that on my movie card was the answer. It was this amazing feeling. I had something that could potentially change what we knew between my fingers. And what he saw on this, the movie card was this. When a hummingbird's tongue hits nectar, it splits in two, creating a fork. Both halves of that fork have these leaf-like flanges running down them, and they also open up. And then, when the tongue retracts, the flanges close, and the tongue melds together again. So hummingbird's tongue is as if you reached out with two hands, physically grabbed some nectar, and yoinked it back into the bird's mouth. It's incredible, and it's so completely counterintuitive. I wrote a piece about this for The Atlantic um, that told not only the biology of the hummingbird's tongue, but also the story of Alejandro and Margaret and how they came, made this discovery. And the piece did incredibly well. Our readers lapped it up. But they, that wasn't deliberate. <laughs> All right. Um, but I think the reason why the piece did really well is that it contains a great story of these people and how they came to be interested in this work and all the, the um, trials and pitfalls they went through to find this stuff out. And then that quote from Alejandro, which just so perfectly encapsulates the glory of science, like how thrilling it is to learn something new. And this is part of your day-to-day. -day. These stories that you live through as part of being a scientist, they matter to me because they are a core, inextricable part of what science is. Those feelings of success and failure, of frustration, of triumph, of pushing against discrimination, of trying to find your place in the world. I wrote a book recently called I Contain Multitudes, um, where I told a lot of those stories. And I think they're important because they're such a powerful way of getting people to appreciate areas of science that they wouldn't necessarily be interested in. Microbes are not a thing that, um, that most people think well of, but I think you can get people to understand why they're interesting by getting them to care about people who care about microbes. And that was the idea behind the book, but not everyone was on board with this. I want to show you one of my one-star Amazon reviews. For those who can't read this, it says, dumbed down journalism, not science. The subject cries out for charts, lists, tables, diagrams, footnotes, text boxes for detail, all absent. The modern idiom of science writing is to avoid the structure and complexity of the subject matter and focus on the feelings and emotions of current practitioners. This gets in the way of explaining the science. This person did not like the book. <laughs> Which is totally fine. People can not like the book. My feelings are not hurt. But I do want to point out, 
what this reviewer thinks of as being science, which is this, charts, lists, tables, diagrams, detail, complexity. And here is what this person felt was antithetical to the entire scientific enterprise, feelings and emotions. I think this is complete nonsense. This idea that science is this cold clinical set of results that reduces it to nothing more than a set of papers published on PubMed. It is so much more than that. It is the stories that I've already talked about. To claim otherwise is to say that this recipe though incredibly detailed, fully captures the experience of shoving this glorious piece of chocolate goodness into your mouth. And of course, it doesn't. It doesn't even come close to capturing the fullness of that. And that's how, but that is still how we think about a lot of science, that we leave out all the stories and all the feelings and emotions at, and deem it to be not science. I get a lot of this as a science writer. I'm sure a lot of you get this as people who actually work in science yourself, that those things are silly, that they are not science, that they are somehow because they are sentimental, they are like they run counter to the empiricism and objectivity of science. Again, I think this is ridiculous. It reminds me a lot of the Jedi. Um, the Jedi were also really keen on getting people to suppress their feelings and emotions, but I put to you that the Jedi were also a bunch of patriarchal nonsense spouters and that everyone in this image is dead. Some of you may have seen a live stream of a submersible called the Nautilus, um, which uh, does deep sea exploration and shows people what it's seeing in real time. It recently found this fish, a gulper eel. And when a group of like, highly trained marine biologists comes across a gulper eel, what they do is not go, oh look, it is a gulper eel, a fine specimen of Europharynx pelicanoides. How fascinating. Instead, they go, oh my god, what is that? It's got googly eyes. Is it mad? And in probably the most relatable moment I've ever seen from a scientist, one of them just went, touch it. <laughs> Tell me again how feelings and emotions are not part of science. Tell me all about it. I wrote this piece about a group of scientists from Harvard run by a, uh, a lab run by an Irani-born scientist named Padi Sabeti, uh, which also includes five Iranian uh, postdocs and students. And this piece is just entirely about how they coped with the announcement of the Trump administration's first travel ban, how it affects their ability to even be part of science in the first place, and how they, joined, they grouped, regrouped as a community to deal with that stress. I wrote this piece about how coral researchers are trying to um, cope with their own mental health struggles, given that they are, they are fa dealing with um, ecosystems that are just dying in front of their eyes. These stories, as I said, are inextricable from science. They shape who we are as scientists and the way that we see, see the world. I want everyone in this room to be able to live their full selves, to embrace all of their stories and to understand how their backgrounds and their, the way they see the world, the way they were brought up affects the research they do. And as part of that, I'm also trying to think really hard about my responsibilities as a journalist, as a person who acts as a gatekeeper to the voices that we see in the media, and how, um, how, the, how the, work, the decisions I make change um, what we perceive of as a scientist. Um, a couple of years ago, following an example set by my colleague Adrienne LaFrance, I decided to look at the number of men and women who I was quoting in my stories and found that I was quoting three times as many men as women. So women made up only 25% of the voices in my pieces. And this felt completely unacceptable. It is par for the course of the industry, but it's something I wanted to change, and I did. I made special efforts to try and reach out to more women in the stories that I write uh, and, to, um, and to keep a spreadsheet that chronicles every single piece I write and the gender split of the sources who I contact. And it took only about four months to raise that proportion to 52%, where it has stayed ever since. <laughs> Uh, 
I shouldn't get applause for doing the bare minimum that people should be doing, that, every, that all of us should be thinking about. Um, I've also started having a think of, I've also thought very seriously about the proportion of people of color in, this, in these stories. And that uh, is currently at about 27%, which is not terrible, but I think it could be better. I think it could be much better. Um, and I'm now trying to make even more active efforts to raise that proportion, to act proactively seek out people of color in the fields and in the beats that I regularly cover. Um, totally happy to take pictures from people about interesting science that they see. But I want to tell you that I think that this is not a end point for me. This is very much a, a journey. It is something that I think I still need to make um, large amounts of progress on and that, and, and that I am committed to. Um, because I don't want to live in a world that Adrienne described in her piece, one in which the voices and contributions of women and people of color and other marginalized groups are undervalued and underappreciated. I want a place where um, the pieces that I write reflect the world that we see around us, reflect the, the community that I see in this room. And I think this matters a lot because People, the people who are in science shape the science that gets done. I think about this a lot in the context of this man, uh, Ben Barris. He is a neuroscientist from Stanford who died sadly at the end of last year. Ben spent a lot of time talking about the problems that women face in science and the discrimination suffered by them and other marginalized groups. And Ben should know because he was a transgender neuroscientist. He knew full well the experiences um, of both women and men in science. And he spoke about these very openly in many meetings. In one, he said that by, for, by far the main difference that I've noticed uh, after uh, is that people who don't know I'm transgender treat me with much more respect. And I I can even complete a whole sentence without being interrupted by a man. Ben, I think, is really interesting, not just because of his advocacy on behalf of marginalized groups, but because he also um, is a very well-known neuroscientist because of his work on glia cells, the cells that are not neurons in the brain and that for a long time were, were viewed as just playing a supporting role. And Ben's work and that of his mentees shows that glia are actually incredibly important. And I don't think that it is a coincidence that someone who thought very hard about the um, experiences of marginalized communities in science was also the person who realized that this group of cells, which make up half the brain, and had long been relegated to a supporting role and been underappreciated, were actually super important. I think the people who we are affect the science that we do. And I think that is as good a reason as any to try and push for increasing representation of as many groups as possible, to push for diversity in STEM fields. Um, and that is what I want for the future. I think I, um, I've said that stories matter. I specifically want to say that your stories matter, that by embracing your full selves and sharing your stories, we can create a world in which people can better see a place for themselves in science. Um, my partner, Liz Neely, runs an organization called the Story Collider. That's her on the left with her artistic director, Erin Barker. They get scientists and people adjacent to science to tell true personal stories on stage. And they're committed to getting a wide diversity of people on their stage and on their podcast. A man named Jeff Shinsky recently did a study where he showed students at a community college a selection of these stories from scientists of a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, genders, uh, uh, racial backgrounds, sexual orientations, and more. Ben Barris was one of those people. And afterwards, the students said that they were more likely to see a place for themselves in science. That's why I think stories matter. And that's certainly why I think SACNAS matters and why I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much.